I am Vinny Tutterton, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen. Don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there. Before long, you shall be lean and mean. This is a Friday show. You know what that means? We bring in a luminary, uh, someone that's got way more knowledge uh, than I do, and uh, they just they spread it out there, and then you guys get it, and then we're all smart. That's just the way it works. This guy's been on the show before. This guy is instrumental in a lot of my life, believe it or not. Um, he He's not just the, the guest of the show today. He works behind the scenes uh, at purevitaminclub.com. He also works behind the scenes at vinnytartaries.com. I don't know, where do I... I don't even know where I pay him from. I don't know what, I'm really not sure what he does for a living, but a lot of times he will tell me, I don't do that for you when I call him, which is always confusing for me because I'm always thinking it's my money. So why can't you do that for me? Like, because you pay me to do other things. I'm talking about Scott Mulvaney. How you doing, brother? Great to be on, Vinny. It's been too long. Yeah, as far as, as, far as podcasts go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we we talk all the time, but uh, we have a very good reason to have you on today. Uh, you did uh, the craziest thing any human ever does. Uh, you wrote a book, and I got to tell you, folks, this is not like someone wrote a pamphlet and then turned it into one of those vanity press books and put it out there so his mom can be impressed with him. This is a real book. This is kind of like when I wrote Fitness Confidential and put it out there, and then it became like this this kind of juggernaut of my life, uh, which I'm very happy about because it's been a very, very sweet ride. Um, Scott, you wrote a book, and this title, I love the title. It's called So You Want to Be a Hot Shot. And by the way, folks, you can go right now. It's in the Vinny Tartarich Book Club. If you go to VinnyTartarich.com, Click on, on, on the book club or the Amazon link or whatever. It's going to be front and center in the book club when the show comes out. And uh, so you'll see it there. You'll be helping this podcast if you do that also. Um, Scott, start by explaining. We're going to go back. I just want you to explain one thing, and then we're going to go back a little bit. Explain to the audience what a hot shot does, because this is not an easy job. Even, even I didn't know it was not an easy job until I put myself into it. So yeah, so a hot shot. Uh, actually, the title was fun because uh, I wanted to just catch people's attention because like, well, what do they mean, right? So a hot shot, as I learned over a decade ago, is one of the elite levels of, of wildland firefighting, at least here in the United States of America. So uh, wildland firefighting does exist all over the world, but obviously, Vinny, being a guy who used to live many years in California, yeah. West, the Western U.S. knows what wildland firefighting is all about. Um, here on the East Coast, where I live now and where I'm actually originally from, not so much. And that that was my awakening over a decade ago. My, when I heard what a hot shot was, I was like, what's a hot shot? What's wildland firefighting? Never yeah. heard of such a thing. You know, here you have people fighting structure fires, You know, volunteer fire companies, city fire companies. So hot shot just like, and I always want to clarify this for people, there's smoke jumpers and there's hot shots. A lot of people are like, oh man, you're those guys who skydive out of the plane. I'm like, no, 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 no. I was a hot shot. There's a difference. They're both type one incident response crews. They're the best of the best, but the hot shots hike everywhere. Like we hike in, you don't, right. you don't skydive in. The smoke jumpers skydive in and there's less of them. They're even more specialized. So those are two type one level crews. So uh, basically you're doing a job that beats the living snot out of you 16 hours a day. <laughs> you know, it's crazy because when you think about a hot shot, you know, a lot of times, you know, Cody Cod and I were up on, uh, you know, um, uh, where was I last month? Help me out. Uh, Whitney, Mount Whitney. Whitney. Yeah. And a fire happened a few weeks before that. It's fire season. It happened on Whitney a few weeks before that. We saw the burned area when we were going up the mountain. And another fire could happen. Right. So, you know, he's all, Coddington is always like, man, you see lightning and you turn around. And it's like, yeah, I'm not worried about get, getting hit by lightning is like, you know, come on. Is, you know, is it's that so really going to happen? Yeah, so rare. But lightning starting a fire on the mountain, you know, and when I see that, I don't want to be caught out. 
And I was making escape plans more than I was worried about climbing the mountain. I said, okay, if we're up there and we learn that there's a fire down below, we're dropping down the other way on the John Muir Trail and we're going down to Guitar Lake and that's where we're going to stay because there's no trees down there. There can be no fire. It's Literally, we would be traveling miles, probably another 10 miles away from going back home, mm -hmm. which would put us 20 something miles out. But at least you're at a lake where you can be protected and there's, you know, above a tree line and all that stuff. Uh, you can still die from smoke, but the chances are you can be saved. So I, I can drop some terms on you right now. You are a very well educated Californian. And what you were doing was keeping your SA up. I have a chapter on that. It's called situational awareness. You had your situational right. awareness dialed in. And then like all wildland firefighters per our training, you, before you step foot into a fire, you already have designated at least two escape routes planned, which usually should be ending at two established safety zones, areas that if you, God forbid, you had to ride out a wildfire, that would become your safety zone. You always had one to back up the other. So very well-planned hiker. <laughs> uh, young Scott, um, you may or may not have seen the movie Roadhouse. Oh, yeah. Loved that. Okay. When I was in college... I was what you call a cooler. Ah, okay. I was a cooler. And the one thing you learn as a cooler, young man, is how to, number one, assess situations and be ready. You know, everybody thinks, oh, you just stand there and you get them like in a knuckle lock behind their back or something or something weird. No, you're always looking. You're looking for the, the weird thing. I always tell people when you go hunting, because fires happen, you, forest fires and all that. You know, Serena, everyone's ever been out with me in a while and I'll go, oh, look, there's a bear over there. Oh, look, there's a deer over there. And they'll go, wait a minute, how did you see that? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, when you spend your whole life in a swamp and you're outdoors and all that, you look for the anomaly, right? Um, most everything in a forest or in a swamp or whatever goes up and down, trees. Mm -hmm. When something goes horizontal, your eye goes to that. Right? Why is that horizontal? Most times it's a tree that fell, but a lot of times it's an animal, right? Mm -hmm. And you see these things. You you know you understand these things. Uh, I learned that in clubs years and years ago. I was in uh, this honky tonk with a young Jewish guy and uh, his cousin. Just the fact that you just said honky tonk and young Jewish guy in the same sentence is hilarious. <laughs> in the middle of big sky, Montana, where only, you know, like badasses go. And his cousin, she was in her 20s at the time. She's looking at all these kind of rough and tumble guys and she's going, oh, yeah. Yeah, I want one of these guys tonight. You know, she was on the make. <laughs> and um, we were there and she was had, getting her drink on. And as you know, I'm, I'm a one drink guy. I'm nursing a drink at the bar and uh, talking to the bartender and I'm looking around and the younger kid, uh, he was, uh, he was playing pool because he knew how to play pool and uh, he got into a pool game and the whole thing. And all of a sudden couldn't have been any later than 11 o'clock. I collected the girl. I don't want to give her name out uh, because I've already said she was on the make and she's probably a married woman. now. And I collected her and I collected the guy. And I said, we're out of here right now. And they said, oh, we just got started. I said, no, we, you got, you want to keep drinking? We go back to your, you know, they have, they own the house there. And the we go back, we do all the drinking you want at the house. You want to invite the guy that you're trying to sleep with, invite him back to the house. We're out of here. And they got in the car and they were like, what the hell, mister? I got to get up early and go cross country ski. What, what, come on, what, what, what are we doing here? Why, what, why did you pull us out of there? And I said, because uh, the situation is getting bad in there. And uh, these gentlemen, they might not just throw punches. They might have knives. They might have guns. But uh, I didn't like the situation in that bar. It was, it was starting to sour a bit. It was starting to get a little frisky. And they were like, you don't know that. How can you tell that? And, you know. The only thing we heard on the ski slope the next day was that, oh, my God, did you hear that there was a shooting at the such and such bar? Mm -hmm. There was a shooting about 45 minutes after we left. 
And I think someone got stabbed too. I, I can't remember. I don't want to tell this story, but the bottom line is, is you always look around. You're you're always aware of where you are in life. And and, and by the way, Scott, that's one of the things I loved about this book is when you sent it to me and said, Hey, man, I wrote a book. I went, Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> really? You wrote a book. You know, I didn't say that to you. I said that to myself. I think to you, I said, Oh, great. And then you said, Would you read my book? And in my mind, I went, Oh, Jesus Christ, really? And yeah, you know, I started reading through it. And I didn't just get into it. I got into it. At some point, I wanted to be a wildland firefighter, you know, and, um, and even though I can't, I mean, I'm 59 years old in a couple of weeks. You know, I'm, I'm arthritic head to toe. But you're reading this book, and it's kind of like I've always said to people, I will go on the internet now. It's one thing I like about the internet. I will Google something stupid like how to become a lifeguard. Mm -hmm. Right now, I know how to do it. And I'm a good swimmer and the whole thing. I grew up swimming, grew up in a swamp. But I'll just go learn everything it takes to become a lifeguard. Yeah, well, you, YouTube University, as I like to call it, right? Everything's yeah. got a video. Everything's got a video now. So, yeah, so why not? But I'll go read. I like to read stuff. And it's like, I, I'll just, I want to learn what it takes. What, what does it take to do that? Like, uh, you know, I like messing around with archery in my backyard. And then I see the Olympics. And I see these archers and I'll go, I wonder what it takes to get, I mean, these guys are, they're hitting bullseyes at 70 yards away, 77 yards, I think. And when, what does it take to become that guy? I know, right? Now, there's no way I'm going to become that guy, but I'll, I'll never forget that uh, Gina Davis, the, the actress, she was watching the Olympics at one time when she was much younger in her 20s. And she, she looked at the same thing. I wonder what it, And she almost made the Olympics. She became an expert archer and just missed the team by like, one hour or something weird like that. I can't remember what the story was. But you know, it's that 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 curious, quizzical mind, where you just want to learn stuff. And this book had that in spades. And folks, I can't wait to tell you more about this and have Scott tell us about the impetus of how he came up with this whole thing. But first, I have to tell you about Bel Campo, Bel Campo, B E L C A M P O Bel Campo dot com. As a matter of fact, Right after this show, probably two shows down the road, the great Anya Fernald is coming back on. Yep, Anya Fernald started off on this show. She owns Bel Campo. You ever want to just get your, your the, the juices flowing in your mouth? Go check out what Anya Fernald is doing on um, on how do you say Instagram? Oh my God, I go there sometimes. It's food porn. The woman it, it knows is. what she's doing. It, it's right. It, I'm crazy. It, it, it is right. Right, Scott. It's oh, I, I, I sent meat to my own parents from her farm. So yeah. uh, I'm a huge, huge supporter of Bel Campo. Bel Campo, as a matter of fact, Marie Tartarich is now a user of the promo code Vinny. She called me and she goes, honey, do I have to put capital V or small V? I've never done a promo code before. And I was like, my, you could put it, just put capital, just spell my name the way you gave it to me and you'll get 15% off. And she started doing this because of Hurricane Ida. She was on the show talking about it. She heard me talking about Bel Campo and she goes, you know what? We, we don't know if the meat we're getting down here is fresh, all these fr fridges and freezers and the whole thing. She just called Bel Campo and now she's getting her meat. I told her, I said, man, I'll mess around with a hundred, get a couple of hundred dollars, fill your deep freeze. And she did. I think she spent 300 bucks. So she and Cy are covered for meat for a while and they got 15% off. So let's see, 15 times... Uh, 300 that's $45 off plus free shipping. She can't buy number one, she can't buy that quality of meat unless she goes and gets a cow slaughtered. And I don't think they did that since us kids moved out of the house. That's how you feed a bunch of kids. You buy a whole cow. Um, but yeah, th this quality of meat, man, Bel Campo, go check it out. That's what Maria is doing. Anna does it. Scott Mulvaney's doing it. Bellcampo.com, B-E-L-C-A-M-P-O, 15% off if you put in promo code Vinny. If after the discount code, you're plus $100, you will get free shipping. Okay, we're talking to Scott Mulvaney. He wrote a book called, uh, So You Want to Be a Hot Shot. I've read the book. As a matter of fact, I wrote a forward, a backwards. What did I it's, write for the book? It's called, I, well, I, I learned it's called an after forward. So I, my, my, one of my old fire bosses wrote the forward. You wrote the after forward. I didn't even know there was such a thing. 
Uh, I was like, okay, my editor taught me a lot. I was like, what's an afterfold? I don't know. So, but yes, you, you honor the book and wrote the afterfold. And I thank you again for that. So it meant a lot to me. So as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you what happened. Um, in, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I worked with Scott's editor, who's a fabulous woman. And I said, Hey, let's write, you know, I'll give you some ideas and you throw it together and write it. And I realized that it didn't sound like it came out of my mouth. And I just sat down like there was a deadline looming. And I'm in the middle of doing a movie and I'm in the middle of doing 20 other things. And I said, you know, this, I need to do this book justice. And I sat down and wrote that well, oh, believe fun. me, I, we were texting and, and Hillary was like, I told Vinny, I've got him covered. And I was like, no, you don't know Vinny. I was like, Vinny's words matter. I was like, he's probably going to, he's like, you can do your best, but he's still going to probably rewrite it himself. <laughs> and it did. So I, I sent her at ease. She was worried. She wasn't doing a good job. I was like, Hillary, you're oh, she, amazing. No, no, you're yeah, amazing. She's an amazing woman. She does a good job. And um, look, what she needs to understand is I sat in the booth and read my entire book. Uh, for my my book, you know, I, I did the the audi audible myself. Mm -hmm. When I heard it, I didn't like it. I went back in and did the whole thing again. You know, and it cost money, it cost time, it, you know, the amount of time it takes to, you don't just sit there and read it straight through it takes for are you doing an audio of your book? I have Oh, yeah. And I'm gonna I'm following every step that you've done with your book. So I'm that's the next step is now I got to do the audio book. So talk about um, that, uh, Scott. So did, did you really you, did you I thought you were blowing smoke up my ass. But did you really go? Oh, wait, Vinny was able to do this. So maybe I can do a type of thing. I yeah, told I, you that's why I invited you to write the after forward. So I, I have no, I, I I've just, never I, I thought you were I blowing people, smoke up my ass. Sir, I no, 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 this is no ego me. stroke. I don't believe in that shit. You know me. That's why you and I get along. There's no stroke in egos here. It's like, listen, I told people a while ago, I was like, dude, when I launched my live the fuel podcast, I told you, you were one of my influencers. So, cause I was, I'd already started listening to your show cause you've been around longer than most. I mean, aren't you going on like nine years now? I forget. Is it uh, maybe 10, I think. I don't even know. Um, cause you've been doing it for so long. And then I, I, I actually, I mentioned this on another, I was just on a, uh, a firefighting podcast talking about the book, a guy from California. And uh, he, I told him how thanks to firefighting cause your life is just on the road going from wildfire to wildfire. By my second year, I became even more enthralled in podcasts and audiobooks because you're just you're sitting in a crew carrier crossing multiple states to get to the next big assignment, right? So you got all this time. So I always tell people, like, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. What are we doing at that time? Are you sitting there playing video games in the back of, the, of your of your what was called a buggy in, in the book? I was like, or are you being productive? Are you learning? So I just started crushing podcasts and audiobooks, and yours is one of the ones I follow. And then I heard your story, how you're like, well, I don't exist online. I didn't have a digital footprint. And I have a marketing background and a sales background. So even before fire and then after fire, obviously, because you and I work together to this day, it's, it's funny how that all comes full circle. But I was like, I need to create a digital footprint. I was like, well, Anna told Vinny to do that. And they figured it out. So I was like, okay, well, prove, there's a proven case study. So I will just go do the same. <laughs> so, and then, but at that time, I wasn't sure if I was going to write a book. But I was excited about creating a digital footprint. And I said, what if? So I laid the groundwork, said, okay, let's start the podcast. And just if I end up writing a book, awesome, right? Because then I at least exist somewhere online. So yeah, you're one of my uh, influencers on that. So yeah, you know, it was really strange. You know, I'll never forget, I, I met a guy named Rob, back when I was crewing for the 508, uh, not the 508, I was crewing for the race across America for my buddy, Dave, David Holt. And Rob was on his crew and Rob was an IT guy who created his own kind of online store. Now this is early, this is like 2007 ish, six, seven, somewhere around there. Right. And like, I had no idea what the computer was or, you know, I hear things and I talk to people and they just kind of stay in the back of my head. And I said to Rob, how did you, create the store. He goes, well, I created the store. And then this is way before like, I mean, Amazon was out there, but there was like a bookseller type of thing. And he's like, I created the store and I do blogs and people read my blog. And then I have these things they could buy. And like some stores came out of that, like, uh, you, you know, Moose Jaw, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah. And 
you know, all of these online, you know, explain what Moose Jaw is. You could go there and buy any we, guys like us would go to Moose Jaw. I'll say you got to be an outdoorsy. You got to at least enjoy the outdoors. How about that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> like you might, you got to have a little bit of a clue about gear. Um, yeah. Actually, cause I'm a gear nut. I talk about that in the book too. And you're a gear nut, like buy the right product the first time. Stop. Uh, that's my tip of the day for, for the show too. Is like, don't, and I talk about in the book, like I, you're the same way I hear about on your show. You're like guys, just do the research, find great companies like Moose Straw who do actually don't just put any kind of crap up on their website. Like they have decent gear for decent pricing. So like, you want fleece jackets. I mean, you have to even have a uh, indoor bike trackers on there, which is they have everything. Uh, uh, backcountry yeah. is another backcountry.com. I'm a big fan yeah. of backcountry. So. Yeah, you know, all of these companies, you know, I, I whenever I need something, I just go to them because I know it shows up on time. If it's not the right thing, they take it back and on and on and on. And but at the time he was telling me how he did this. And I went, oh, that's interesting. But this was like 2007 or eight. And all I could think was, I will never go on the internet. I don't want anyone to know my name. Because I was working in the celebrity world. Right, that was it. I was just training celebrities, and you know, everyone. You were top secret. <laughs> yeah, pretty much because and people go, well, well, were your clients that big? Yeah, some of them, a lot of them were that big. And the question you always get is, why, why were you so secretive about you, and why are you still so secretive about your clientele? And it's it's twofold. Even like, let's take Howie Mandel. That people know that we're friends and the whole thing. I will get people calling me going, Hey, man, I know you don't do this. But we have a charity coming up. Can you give Howie a call? No, I can't give Howie a call. No. I, I'm not going to call Howie and say, Hey, Howie, look, uh, my cousin wants you to come down and do the raffle at their high school. It, that's not for me to do. I can't do that. So it's better if they don't know that I know Howie, right. But our relationship kind of got out there as buddies, right. But there are other people. I'm going to name someone who's not who's never been a client, right? But someone who's had trouble. So um, Britney Spears is a great example. She's never been a client of mine, but she's had a troubled past where she oh, yeah. had some chemical imbalances or whatever. If you look at that relation, you know, the media would always say sources close to. Well, who do you think those sources were? It was a, a cleaning trainer, person, a, mazo yeah, a masseuse, a, a clean, yeah, 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 the, the, the guy that drove her around. The private the, chef. You know. Right. So I always thought that it was better for me to stay away from that. That way, the paparazzi, you don't get calls from People Magazine every third minute, that kind of thing. So I did my best to stay off of the internet until I wrote Fitness Confidential. And Everyone wanted to do it. And they said, you know, we keep Googling you and you're not on Google. And I was going, that's a good thing, right? And they were like, because I thought it was a good thing. I didn't even have a, one of these phones. I had a flip phone mm -hmm. when when I, I started. No smartphones, no smartphones. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I'm lying. Uh, I had gone from the flip phone to a BlackBerry. Oh, I and, had the CrackBerry for many years. <laughs> yeah, and um, but I just pretty much use it as a phone or to text people, you know, hey, you know, I'll be there in five minutes or whatever. I, I, I there was no nothing for me, no internet, no nothing. I thought that was a good thing. Because all I heard was the internet can ruin your life. Okay. And then all of a sudden, I found out I had to be on the internet. Little did I know people like Scott Mulvaney would be in, in a crew cab, looking for a fire listening to me on the internet. That's crazy, right? Right? Yeah. You weren't thinking about that. <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking, hey, I need to sell a few copies of this book. So how did you get from being a hotshot to doing what you're doing now? Because you're, you're excellent at what you do. We wouldn't have you hired on if you weren't. Oh, yeah. When you, when you and I started working together, I didn't even launch my new marketing company brand, which is now called Fuel Up Marketing. I was just communicating through you guys through the podcast world because of Living Fuel. And again, people have heard me on your show before, like you and I ended up working together only because I sent you a bunch of crowdfunding tips because I'd worked on crowdfunding campaigns before. So when you were trying to fund that a documentary one, I was like, Vinny, I'm so excited. I'm, you know, I'm one of your super fans here. You've been on my show. I've been on your show. Take this list of tips and give it to your crowdfunding team. And then all of a sudden you and Serena call me from the car and you're like, um, yeah, so our marketing girl bailed and you had some great tips. You know, do you understand Instagram? I'm like, 
Yeah, actually, I do. I, I made a joke on the fire podcast the other day. He just aired that show. I was like, dude, everybody, my fire brothers made fun of me because I would take a whole bunch. I had a, I had one of those um, Olympus camera company. I had a tough series, 35 millimeter camera carabiner to my, my, my backpack uh, strap on my chest. So as I'm hiking in the mountains and we get a chance to take a break, hydrate, whatever, snack up, um, I would just take my camera out and snap fire photos. So, but when I had days off, I would then go download everything off of the chip. I didn't have a smartphone back then. This is 2010 and 2011. And then I would post everything to Facebook and then I would disappear for another month <laughs> because like, that's how people knew I was alive. It's like, oh, I mean, I would try and call friends and family that were closest to me when I had a cell phone signal. But, you know, areas like Montana, Wyoming, yeah, heck, even parts of remote California, Oregon, you don't always have cell phone coverage. No, uh, not so, at all. Yeah. So it's like, oh, Scott, Scott's alive. There's, there's some badass photos showing up. <laughs> and then it's, it's funny because now years later, I, I manage social media for clients like you and, and, and work with your, your partner, Andy, on Pure Vitamin Club and Pure Coffee Club and Edison G Foods and all that stuff. So it's funny how, okay, I left the corporate world because I hated it. I had paid my own way back to school. I talk about this in the book, nights and weekends to do my degree in marketing and psychology. And then I find out about wild and firefighting and I'm like, well, you know, if I don't do this now, uh, what if I can ever do it? And I was already 31, 32, and I was considered the old guy on the crew. So boom, fast forward, find the fire academy in Long Island, New York, get certified, then go to Colorado, try and network at another fire academy, land the job. They're worried because I'm considered the old guy, I'm air quoting uh, for the video, for the video people on YouTube. And then I get to serve on one of the elite crews in the nation, which was amazing and was a very grounding, humbling, and asking experience. And I did my two years. I earned my belt buckle. And uh, I say, you know, I'm still capable of doing other things and more. I, I don't see this being the full-time career. And in the federal government world, I've never been a government employee. I found out if you want to qualify for all that pension stuff and all the benefits, like you've got to be in a full-time position. I think it was by time you were 36 at the latest. And me, like 85% of the other amazing volunteer, not volunteer, but uh, wildland firefighters out there, whether you're a hotshot smoke jumper or just a regular type two crew or hell attack or air attack or all these different positions. Most of these people are seasonal employees. They hire you on at the beginning of the fire season. At the end of the summer season, they, they lay you off. You have guaranteed unemployment and they bring you back again the next year. But that's the government's way of getting around paying you as a full-time employee with all the benefits and everything else. So I would have had to stay in for another couple of years, continue to prove myself, and hopefully a full-time position would open up and I could get it. Because if I would have wasted a couple more years and I was not guaranteed anything. So I was like, you know what? I had my adventure. Let me go try to do some contract work. And I bounced around from Colorado to Pennsylvania for a couple of years, did some contract sales gigs, stuff like that. And then Eventually, I just pulled the ripcord and started my own business. So it's that was fast forward. That started in 2014, uh, doing stuff as a side hustle. So I tell people all the time, like, just because you're working for somebody else doesn't mean you can't keep learning other things in your free time. And then it becomes your company. So um, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but what did it pay, including the off-season uh, unemployment? What, like, what, what is it? I mean, you guys are doing, you know, the word hero gets thrown around, but you guys are actual heroes. You're Be, doing a job that no one wants to do. Oh, yeah. The, 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 I, I forget what the statistics were, but I, I remember back in the day, I should look this up. The percentage of people who even know what a hot shot was, right? Because I didn't know what it was, right? Let alone wildland firefighting as, as, a, as a job in the world is very, very small. Then the percentage of people who even know what hot shots are, smoke jumpers are, is even less. Then the people who actually want to do it as a job <laughs> is even less. Uh, so I can't speak to the unemployment factor because it never met what you did, but obviously they base it off of your base salary, which is a joke. Uh, but your base salary as a seasonal federal employee is crap. So I, I literally went from a corporate salary to that. It was a very, I mean, I went, I sold my, I used Audi at the time. Uh, Audis are expensive to fix. So I was like, I can't have this as my, road warrior for driving cross country. So I picked up a, a used Subaru Outback wagon for three grand cash wow. and uh, put the road bike on the roof, the mountain bike on the roof, fit my two pairs of skis, my rock climbing gear. That car was full of just gear. I talk about in the book. I only had one duffel bag of personal clothing. You get this as an athlete too. 
Yeah. All the other North Face Base Camp duffel bags in my car or my backpacking gear, whatever, it's all athletic gear. <laughs> wow. So uh, anyway, the, the salary was a joke because I literally make a joke about this. Mike, we were wishing for wildfires. It's really kind of weird. Like you're here to help mitigate them and keep, keep people, keep, keep the fires in the wildlands, not, not encroach upon, you know, a civilized, uh, you know, home built areas. But it's like, right. we only made money, real money to, to survive. If you're, uh, once you get assigned to a fire, okay, great. Now you have a guaranteed 16 hour shift. Uh, you get guaranteed double time because you're working 16 hours. You get hazard pay percentages. You want to work the holidays because you're getting, so that's how you make your money. So my first year as a rookie, I think I came home. This doesn't include the rest of the year. This is from April to September when we got laid off. I think I did about somewhere between 30 and 35 grand for that summer. So that's six it's months a, of work. Yeah, so, so it's a, it would be a $60,000 a year job, right. which is nothing to do the kind of work you guys were doing. No. And people are like, wait, how many hours is that? I said, well, think about it. 16 hours a day. So do, do the math. Uh, the average nine to five are out there working 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You get two weeks of pay vacation a year, your jobby job world that I, I did in the corporate space. Um, that's 2,000 hours. Right. We would cram 1,900 to 2,000 hours into one summer as a wildland firefighter. Seasonal, sorry, seasonal wildland firefighter. So the full timers then continue working the rest of the year. So it's pretty crazy the amount of hours you can cram in in one summer. <laughs> and obviously, yeah. this year, you and I are recording this in 2021, very aggressive fire year very aggressive wildfire. Wow. So I mean, not, not just us, Greece, Turkey, I mean, crazy wildfire year. So yeah, you don't get paid a lot. So to yeah, do actually one of the, I, I heard it was one of the top five most dangerous jobs in the world. I don't know if that's a true statistic oh, or not. I, I believe it. I mean, I, it's, a, it's, it, you know, I would start studying the people who want to go into that as a career because it's like, is who who would do that? You're as crazy as the woman who stood up against the dartboard in a knife show and let guys bring uh, knives at their head. Circus yeah. acts, yeah, yeah, okay, like, I, that I agree with. So uh, it's, it's kind of like that. It's like every night uh, you go to work, you could die. My my friends and family were pissed at me. I talk about that in the book too. I'm like, I didn't realize how pissed they were. My family was very worried. Right? They're like, wait a minute. And and my friends of years, my colleagues, they're like, Scott, you you've worked your way up from nothing, like answering phone calls in the call center world to paying your way through school to having the degree, you have this great resume and you're just going to give it up. And I said, if it's worth anything, it'll be there when I'm done. But I was like, I have to do this. I have to do something crazy. Once I set my mind to something, I'm into it. Nobody understood it. No one got, no one could comprehend my insanity as, as some of my friends would say. And uh, yeah, it, you know, it's hilarious. I tell you all the time, you can love your friends. You can love your family. But in the end, when it comes to your path and your mission, you got to make your own decisions. Don't let other people make that for you. Oh, absolutely. Um, talk about, you know, and I love this piece of the book. Talk about the night that you heard the, the name Hotshot. You, you were at a party. If I remember it right, I read it so long ago. There was some chick there and you said, what do you do? And she goes, oh, I'm, I'm a hotshot. And oh, that was Shasta. That was Shasta. Yeah. That was a short term romantic endeavor, uh, you know from your bar story. Uh, so I was at a friend's house party here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, shout out to Jeff and uh, a girlfriend of his, just a friend, uh, our friend, now still a friend of mine to this day, Kelsey, uh, who actually married my wife and I, she got internationally ordained. She's that close of a friend. Uh, we spent years ski race coaching together. Her girlfriend, because she, she grew up in Nevada, uh, right near Lake Tahoe and grew up ski racing at Kirkwood. So her girlfriend Shasta was living out here named after Mount Shasta, California, right? So uh, her sister's name was Denali. I'm like, okay, I was like, your parents had to be hippies. I'm really? Like, hey, I'm not kidding Shasta you, dude. Shasta and like, Denali. Shasta and Denali. I was like, oh, that's that's so hot. <laughs> so I was like, I've got to find a way to to figure this one out. So anyway, uh, she was. I was like, and that was my first like girl ever. Like, I didn't even officially date her. Whatever, short term romance. But I was like, this girl's so different because she's West Coast, and you get it, like. Girls are wired and differently. I'm sure guys oh, too, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, exactly. I'm a guy that was born in Jersey and grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania and then, you know, chased corporate dreams. So I, she and I are exactly opposite. <laughs> so I was like, so what do you do? Like, what is your goals? What are you doing? She's such a laid back chick. I think she was cleaning the houses or something while she was here. She's like, well, I'm about, I'm about to move back to Nevada. I was like, what are you going to do? 
She's like, I'm going to be a hot shot. So we're having drinks. And I'm like, the hell's a hot shot? <laughs> She's like, you know, while I'm firefighting, I'm like, still no clue. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then she told me all about it. And it, it, it just got like blazoned into my head. I was like, wait a minute, you're going to go do this. And I'm not saying that women can't do this because once I got to serve, I saw some badass chicks like hammering out, digging in the dirt, wielding chainsaws. I was like, it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl, if you're psychotic enough to do this job, you're in. And uh, she went back to serve and she said, she's like, I want to just kick ass for a summer and get on a hotshot crew and make the money. And she's very good. She has no, she had no debt. She's one of the first girls I met. She like, like you, man, never had a credit card bill, never had debt. Wait, uh, you met a chick with no debt? I know, right? It's pressing. Oh, actually, that's my wife. That's so she's oh, great. Bliss. Serena. Yeah, Serena. <laughs> right. So what, years later, it takes me into my 40s to then find another girl like that who's way smarter than me because she's a she's an equine horse vet doctor. So it's like, OK, I found a girl who also has. We no call that an Amish mechanic around here. <laughs> I'm using that. All right. I have, that's a new one for me because my dad lives by the Amish. Amish mechanic. I'm writing that down. I'm going to use it on the wife. So, yeah. Uh, she can yeah, just tell her take it, use it. it. She can use it way more than I would. Well, I will say my wife does not work with Amish clients. She does not uh, respect she her whole position. She doesn't respect how they treat the horses. So right. Um, but but anyway. you know, whenever I was you know, I dated a, a girl who was a um, she she had a horse farm and she bred horses and the whole thing. Yeah. And whenever I would I would be there, you know, and the, the vets would come by with their truck with the big that thing on the back yeah, all the mechanical boxes and stuff yeah yeah and then everything slides out and everything and yep. um and of course when you have to check them for breeding season you know you're going through their oh yeah their butt and you pull full off. sleeve they're going all in yeah. by the way i know how to do that shoulder deep what yeah, <laughs> you, you go up to your shoulder and you got to feel so hold on. was this one of your dates i was like hey you know what i i, I you know you got your own horse from i'll help you around here you know <laughs> no and i i was uh i was with this girl for a, a couple of years yeah. yeah, I don't talk about that relationship anymore at okay. all. <laughs> and um, but yeah, you know, whenever the vets were coming, say, oh, the Amish mechanic is here. And yeah. they, they all got a kick out of that. Yeah, it's true. If you open up the back of my wife's SUV, there's a big 500 pound mechanical multi drawer, basically mobile hospital. The, the um, back of yeah. those, the, the the back part of that thing costs like fifty thousand dollars, right? Or more, oh, it's what like she doesn't even have. She won't even buy one. My wife is so uh dialed in financially she's like wait a minute she's like she found like make a professional commercial grade like tool chest cabinetry that yeah. like non-doctors use and she's like well that'll do the same thing because you're right a, a veterinarian medical cabinet is just thousands of dollars yeah. whereas this one she got it scratch and dent for like 1500 bucks but okay. she's like why could why spend five thousand when i could spend fifteen hundred dollars so yeah. smart woman smart woman so uh but yeah it, it's so anyway i meeting a girl named Shasta at a house party, drinking and playing darts. And, and, and just, I think it was just her demeanor and her personality. It just never left me. And then when she moved, uh, I was like, wait a minute, like if she can do it, why can't I do it? And Hang then, on. I, I got to go back to Shasta for a second. <laughs> did she, yes or no, did she wear patchouli oil? You did bring this up in the, <laughs> I think that was in your after forward. No. I didn't even know what that was until you mentioned it on your podcast. I was like, what the hell is Patrick? Did she oil? shave the hair under her arms? Yes. I was worried about that. Uh, but no, she that. she groomed. She groomed. So um and you didn't know what patchouli oil was? Not until you brought up on your show, man. So yeah, that's hippie juice right there. Yeah. I mean, it's, obviously, this is not olive oil. This is like essential oil. Is that what it is? I don't even know what patchouli yeah, oil is. I, I, it's, it's patchouli is a type of flour or something. And and yeah. you've smelled chicks with patchouli oil. Some dudes like you'll smell it. Like in the vegan community, these guys that are like super. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You'll smell they'll smell like B.O. and patchouli because patchouli we've, smells like B.O. We've got a friend going through that right now at the yeah. gym at my friend at my wife's CrossFit gym that she trains at. She's like, hey, so and so she's not using deodorant because she's worried about the aluminum and the chemicals and stuff I'm like yeah but there's other options she's like no yeah. she just went cold turkey i was like oh okay yeah. how's that going she's like nobody wants to work now next to her I was like, okay. I, look i don't use regular deodorant i haven't in years i don't use anything with aluminum or anything but no yeah. i don't smell you've been next to me yeah i actually have i found a deodorant company that's handmade in colorado they make soaps too and they do it the old school way there's no metals nothing in it so yeah. 
Work, work like, like a charm. Anyway, um, so Shasta <laughs> is there at the party, and uh, you guys. She drops the hotshot bomb on me, and it stuck. And that was back in 2007. So I was still taking nights classes, you know, doing my degree, paying my own way through school, working my you know corporate job, and uh, you know she. I think she moved back, and then she served. She served in 2008, and then I continued just researching firefighting in my free time. And once I figured out that I had that degree done by the end of 09, that's when I found the Academy in New York and I started putting everything in motion. So I yeah, started minimalizing and getting rid of things and, and, and uh, set off across the country. My first cross country road trip <laughs> with my life in my car, hoping for the best. So, yeah. Listen, I, I, I hate to sound like Shasta and her sister, Ma Blanc, but um, <laughs> it, how, how freeing is that to, not have, you know, I, I think I talked about it in my book, but I've talked about it before. You know, when I left New Orleans, I didn't have many things to get rid of. I had like a couch. I remember having a television that I never turned on. Like I had this really nice Sony television. That's when Sony televisions meant something back when they were as wide as they were deep. Yeah, they really dropped the ball on their branding and marketing. Yeah, yeah. this was back in the 80s and yeah. And, and you know, I just gave everything away, it's, you know, because I didn't have much to begin with. Same here. And if if it didn't fit into my forerunner, it didn't come to California with me. And even once I moved there and I got settled, and I was making really good money, I never bought a whole lot of stuff. Um, I did eventually get a television, but I didn't have a couch. I think I famously talked about that. Uh, I had a spinner in front of my television, so. When chicks came over, they they really thought I was like the dude from Taxi Driver or something. They were like, <laughs> well, you don't have a couch, but I didn't. I, mean, I didn't have a couch when I moved back here. And by the way, I lived in very nice, you know, celebrity pool houses, very very elegant places. And you know, my my dog was, you know, wasn't unkempt. You know, Sophie at the time, and I was like, well, you seem like a normal guy, but why don't you have? It's like, well, because. I work 15, 16 hours a day. And if I'm going to do anything be besides sleep, because I had a nice bed, nice bedding, nice, you know, that was all nice. If, if I'm going to do anything in this house, you know, I was all about, you know, ultra cycling and everything. I would just get on the bike. Why buy a couch to put behind the bike? Yeah. Well, when I, it just didn't make any sense for me. Well, it's funny because I literally have a chapter it's actually, I'm looking it up right now. Chapter 11, fitting my life in my car. Yeah. And I talk about that. It was such, uh, it was such a change because I was, I was renting my buddy's townhouse. He was a traveling engineer. So he, he, he was never there. He's like, Hey, I just need somebody to look after the house. The guy was like working over in Africa or something. I don't know. He's like, Hey, I just bought the house as an investment. I was like, cool. I rented his townhouse. So I, next thing you know, I was doing the corporate money and, and I was like, I bought a foosball table and stupid shit that I just didn't need. So I think that was the only thing I sold. I sold, actually, I hooked up a friend of a friend with all the furniture because I didn't care about the money. I was like, whatever. I was like, I could use it for travel money. You want to give me something great? I can put it for gas or whatever. So, uh, and, but when you fit your car, life into a car, it's like, oh, you don't need a lot. And where I lived in Arizona was a, was a rare uh, remote base. A lot of hotshot crews or firefighting crews aren't as remote as when I was served. It's actually, that crew has since moved from Pleasant Valley, Arizona, which was in the middle of the Tonto National Forest, about three hours uh, northeast of Scottsdale and about three hours south of Flagstaff. So we were in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the bottom of the valley that our base was at was still 6,000 feet. So we were doing high altitude style fitness and exercising on our days off and for pre-season pre, uh, pre training. But it, it, they basically had these two giant double wide installation home things next to each other. and. They just split the crew in two. They said, okay, half of you live there and the other half of you live there. We all had these little tiny like college size bedrooms with like a twin size bed. And I just, I stacked all my duffel bags up in the corner. I put the, the bikes out in the shed next to the one house. And that was it. Like I was like, okay. I, I felt like I was I don't know, 18 living in a freshman dorm room <laughs> when right. I was in my thirties. So, you know, I, I met this kid, uh, Blair, he owns a, a mountaineering shop in Lone Pine called Big Willie. And um, yeah, and, and he's just kind of this cool kid, you know, I'm saying kid, but he's probably in his mid 30s now. 
And he was telling me, you, you want to talk about Subaru, he has an oh, he still has the car, just nice. like you still have yours. Um, he has this old Subaru out back. And he lived out of the car for three years. Yeah. And I said, So you were homeless? He goes, No, that's just, you know, I lived in this valley. And he, he, you know, he worked, he made enough money, he goes, I can go sky, I would drive up to Mammoth and go skiing. And I would do all my rock climbing all spring yeah. and summer and you know, mountaineering and do all this stuff. I didn't need anything else. You know, he just had a mattress in the car and whatever was in the car. And we met another guy through Blair, who is like a really accomplished mountaineer. And this guy did some first routes and everything. He's, he's a rock climber. And yeah, he lived in a car, right? That's how they met. He lived in a car right next to this kid. There are a lot of people doing that and accomplishing a lot of things. And then this kid, you know, took all of his knowledge and put it into this little tiny mountaineering store that just has what you need. Mm -hmm. Period. Big Willie. Just, it's, it's, it's the perfect size store. He doesn't have all the flash or anything else. He's lean and mean. Yeah, but you know, the reason I know of Blair is because when I needed something, this, I, went, I went into Big Willie. I didn't go to the, the, the flashier place next door because this kid knew his stuff, Yeah. right? And he, he knew what I needed and when I needed it. And I went, you're my guy. Coddington was the same way. And you know, that's kind of the way that works. See, where I, where I was on the East Coast, I couldn't find cool, badass stores like that. You find, you, you find stuff like that in California and Colorado, and I was the East Coaster. So I actually talked about that in the book, too. I, I actually name drop REI. REI became my go-to store to start preparing because I'm like, okay, what do I yeah. need? I can go in and try on packs. I can throw weight in them. I can make sure it fits me, right? I had to train for pack testing, another fitness chapter in there. It's like, okay, you have to pass a pack test. You have to do a, a 45-pound pack speed hike one foot in the ground at all times three miles in less than 45 minutes with a 45 pound pack on so i'm like okay well i need to figure out a pack but i want to overtrain so i want to make sure the pack can handle more than 45 pounds but then i want to be able to keep this pack for years to come which i still have it it's, right. a, it's a gregory i could go a full week with everything in one pack it's a great pack so i have, to this day I'm, i have no reason to get rid of it it's never failed me so uh but finding good gear and finding that it was a big thing for me so uh, especially when I started living out of the car, like these guys, you said, yeah, I bought, I bought every size of the North face base camp. Duffel. So love those things still have them to this day. Actually, half of my gear is still organized that way because I would pull over and driving through Colorado on I-70 up through the mountains. And if I'm in a wintry area that obviously I'd be doing more of like a crampon style hike. But if I drop into a lower area, then, okay, you know what? The trails might be still rideable. So I take the mountain bike off the roof grab my biking duffel, pull that out. And I got all the clothes to change into and everything else I need. So I, I was a, a bad guy for years. I just, I kept everything in its own bag. I had a skiing yeah. bag, I had a mountain biking bag, I had the hiking camping bag. And to this day, if you go out in my, my new barn at the new house here, some of that stuff is still in separate bags because it's a perfect organization system. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, right here, right. I'm tapping on the wall right yeah. behind this is I call it my little mini REI because all my bags are in there. Yep. And those North Face bags, you're right. I have some of them that are 15 and 20 years old now. Bomber. They Bomber. still keep water out and everything else. You get yeah. pouring rain. Everything is still dry on the inside. Um, so, Scott, I'm going to do a quick break here. And we, I just want to talk for a few minutes about the book and tell people why they should get the book. Folks, Villa Capelli, the longest running sponsor of this show. Go get the oil. Uh, we we're talking about backpacking and hiking in and the whole thing. And yeah, look, I have a company that makes a, a high fat nut butter with an electrolyte in it. And that's great. I also take vials of olive oil. And the only olive oil I will use is Villa Capelli. I famously used it when I would be out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in my kayak, I would have these little vials stuffed in my uh, life jacket, I was able to get them out, open them up. And I, I would always put one of my ultra salts, about a half an ultra salt in a vial. And it made it taste like a caprese salad. It was pretty amazing, folks, you got to go check it out. Uh, Villa Capelli, you want to save 10% and uh, put in promo code Vinny, V I N N I E will get you 10% off every single time at Villa Capelli. There are other things there. If you spend over $100 after, um, after you get your 10% discount, you will also get free shipping. So go check out villacapelli.com, villacapelli.com. Let them know we sent you promo code Vinny. 
10% off, free shipping over $100. We're talking to Scott Mulvaney. The book is called So You Want to Be a Hot Shot. <clears throat> um, famously, uh, David Goggins. Everyone seems to know who David Goggins is. He's a hot shot. He's, uh, I think he worked this season. He missed a bunch of different races he could have been in, 100-mile races, because he is a hot shot. I don't think he serves as a hot shot. I think he serves really? as a regular wild and firefighter because okay. I, you, I have, like you have to be committed you know, for the season as a hot shot. So I don't know if he I, – I, I, I love the guy. I follow him, too. Yeah. You actually I, mentioned, I, I you mentioned assumed, in your phone. I, yeah. I just assumed he was a hot shot. Yeah. Oh, because he's badass. I mean, the guy's, yeah. he's, he's wired differently. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think he just goes up and volunteers and serves as a hot, uh, uh, as a wildland firefighter. Uh, I've always wanted to figure out what branches or what divisions or what crews he's working with. Um, but I mean, then again, he has the fitness level to totally be a hot shot. So I just don't know. I don't think they're actually freeing up a slot because that's a, that's a very vibe vi after for people that are wacky like me. Yeah, it's a hard position to get. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to misspeak. I just assumed oh. that that's what he was doing. Um, so when people get this book, what's the journey in the book? Tell them about the book. I, I decided to write the book because, again, I'm a big believer. You, you and I geek out about some of the same old school books you've name dropped on your podcast, right? Personal and professional development. What's one of your top favorite books of all time you go back and still read? Uh, there's a few. Uh, one is um, um, uh, um, How to Become a Millionaire. Um, the, yeah. Um, God. I put you on the slot there. So. Yeah, you did. No, but <laughs> what, I want to say The Millionaire Next Door because I've read that one. That's also a great one as well. Yeah. So uh, books like that, right? Figuring out like why can't you and I, I, the other one, the you and I didn't come from a lot, right? But we're like, wait a minute. How are these people doing? How do I figure it out? And with all the negative energy going on, I started writing this like two years ago. And I was like, all right, dude, what if I, what if I could die tomorrow, go skydiving like I do or whatever my free time. I was like, if I could leave behind a positive legacy on, you know, on the planet, I would feel much Hang better. Hang on just a second. Yeah. Think and Grow Rich. I there it is. That and there it is. So Think and yeah. Grow Rich is a book I've read a gazillion yeah. times. And again, that's an old classic. So Very I, thought, I thought about it. I was like, you know, Wow, what if what if a book that I wrote like motivated, inspired people enough to maybe get one tenth or one hundredth of the amount of sales that thing is done? And then I thought one step further, and I was like, well, it's not just about my personal and professional transformation and my trials and tribulations, but also to share the message about what hot shots meant to me. And I said, I actually put it in the book, I was like, dude, I've only been, I only did it for two years. So I actually felt guilty about even writing the book. I'm like, wait a minute, who am I to write a book? Uh, who I didn't even do it as a full time career. I only did it full time for two years. So all the stuff I just you know, get, you get out of your own way. And then during the writing of the book, I thought about it and I was like, you know, ever since the Granite Mountain Hotshots, which was a famous uh, hotshot crew that got burned over in 2013, this is one of the worst case scenarios you could ever see or happen to a wildland firefighting crew. We lost 19 of the 20 men. Oof. And I actually I talk briefly about it in the book because. Uh, we, we actually were stationed and served on some of the same divisions in 2010 and 2011. So I got to serve alongside the Grand Mountain Hotshots before their unfortunate passing. And that is a worst case scenario. And I thought about, I was like, man, that could have been me. And that made me dig deep with my family, my friendships. Like I, I, when I left to go be a hotshot, I didn't give a shit what anybody else thought. It was all about me and my next step. But then now older, and I don't know if it's wiser or not, but just you know, older. I was like, you know, I could have put more thought into that or respected what my friends and family, I think were trying to get across to me, their, their, their concerns. And so I, I try and honor that in the book as well. But then during this, this mission, and actually after Grand Mountain died and they got so much publicity for a movie, Californians made a movie about it uh, called Only the Brave. So that's a nice little backstory as well in firefighting, what hot shots were about. Some people like it. Uh, I have some fire leadership that I'm still connected with that I still have never watched it for different reasons. And I'm like, wait, wait, it's called only the brave, only the brave. Yep. And there's some major actors in it. So they actually, I watched it and my wife even was worried. She's like, Hey, do you want me to go to watch it with you? And I was like, I don't know. I think it came out in 2017. We weren't even married yet. We didn't get married until 2019. And I was like, if we go, you're going to see another side of me. No joke, dude. The tears were flowing. I, I couldn't. Cause I was like one massive loss of life. 
Two, I knew those guys. Three, it could have happened to me. There was all kinds of emotion going on watching the movie. I can't go. I've, I've rewatched a, book, a movie, still cry. So I have no problem. If people want to look at that as man points or not, I don't give a shit. I was like, dude, it's, it's a tearjerker. Um, if you can have any connectivity to the loss of, of anybody in, in public service. So I was like, you know, what if I honored that too? So I didn't do a whole chapter on Grand Mountain, but then I learned from this. And then there's been a lot of charities that have popped up over the years. And I was like, wait a minute, how do I write a book that gives back? Because you and I both know that, and yes, your book's done well, but there's a lot of consultants, including Hillary, that have talked to me and said, uh, shout out to Hillary Justin, my editor, and, and now publishing a helper. And she's like, Scott, a lot of authors don't write a book to make money. Yes, you might gain speaking engagements, anything else, which you've done very well with over the years too. And I was like, who knows? Maybe that's part of my journey. But she's like, a lot of people, it's just about that getting that message, getting that story out there to give back. But then I said, well, what if I wrote the book and then don donate all the profits to charity? So that was an epiphany during writing the book because I love giving back. So I was like, oh my God, this is great. So actually a year ago, I founded my own charity called Fuel Foundations. So, that, so then on the back cover of the book, it has Fuel Foundation's logo on it because I make sure that I hold myself accountable. And it says right point blank there that all profits from this book sale will go to Fuel Foundations. And then because I can never know what firefighting related charity is either succeeding or not, then if and when funds build enough, now I can pick whenever we want, you know, my, myself and my board members, we get to say, hey, you know what? This charity seems to be doing good or this family just, just lost their, their father or their wife to a fire like we can give back whenever we want from our charity. So now I've actually morphed the charity into helping other charities and this book is going to benefit that. So that's part of my mission as well. It's like, okay, I'm, I literally published a book to not make me money. <laughs> well, but you, you see that that's kind of the way to do it because um, I, I was pretty sure when like, I, you know, my story also well, so this is for new people who haven't heard this before. I was offered um, upfront money for my book from two big companies, but they wanted me to split my book in half and make it two books. And I wasn't willing to do that. And um, everyone told me I was committing literary suicide by self publishing, mm -hmm. which is what I did. And they said, "Well, you won't make any money. I said, I don't care. I'm putting out the book that I want to put out because I want to motivate people. I don't want to, they wanted me to do things like put shit on a cover that says lose 10 pounds in 10 days and how to get rock hard abs and make it look like a magazine cover. And they wanted me to, to take out some of the story and add in more this and that and the whole thing. I was like, no, this is the book. You guys say you want the book and they're going, Oh, we'll give you double the money if you if we could break this into two books. And I was like, not, again, not interested. I want this book to be like this. And I said, I'm going to self publish it and literally got laughed at, like physical laughs. And they were like, No, really? And I was like, No, I'm, I'm going to self publish. And I did. And boy, look at that. You know, say, it, it might have done a, a hair okay. Yeah. <laughs> just a hair, just a little yeah. bit. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's crazy what that book has been able to do for me. And um, without that book, I wouldn't be releasing my EPA DHA with Krill over at my vitamin company that I started with book money. Boom. I wouldn't uh, be drinking my coffee from my company that I started with book money. I wouldn't be, I don't have it here, but I wouldn't be eating any of my NSNG foods, nut butters, if it wasn't for book money. And God only knows that book help me do a lot. By the way, the movies, I have two movies out. I had a documentary one and two. And I have a third movie coming out soon. Yeah. Right? Oh, man, I, got I mean, granted, we, we crowdfunded the first one. But again, yeah. thanks to your influencer status, right? When you publish a book, it aids in your brand growth, because now you're a published author, right? So that's changes. And I everything. had to use some of my own money to finish the movie, sure. you know, to, to make it a good movie, you know, where did that money come from? I didn't have that money as a trainer. It came from book, book money. money. Yeah. You know, now look, I, I'm not still taking, but the book money made other money for me that I'm able to go to, to help people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm that that's my charity. Yeah, I give to charities. Yeah. And you know, that's good. We, we should all if we have money, we should all give to charities. And I'm a very lucky man. So I can do that. 
but I also believe in giving back by creating things where people can learn. And I try to do it for as close to free as I can. As you know, one of my rules around here is no click funnels, mm -hmm. no, no baiting people, no bait and switch, none of that. Everything we do is straightforward. Yeah. Right, Scott? I mean, you know yeah. that. You give, you've been giving away your NS&G guide forever. Oh, so. yeah. For I still say, I say, listen, keep the first one free. I say you come out with a second one and there's so many fans like me that would be happy to throw a couple bucks at a second, like upgraded version because you've already created so much positive change with the first PDF. So I uh, keep thinking, well, one of the reasons I keep thinking about charging $10 for it, which is nothing, which is nothing um, is because I'm being told by experts, including you, that when you charge for something, people take it a little more seriously they and will. everybody has 10 bucks. There's actually a psychology behind them. Yeah, there there's is. a psychology. And I thought about doing that. But in order to do that, I, I should go and upgrade it a little bit. Although, how do you upgrade something that is that well written, right? I, those things I can do. I Knowing know you, you'll find a way. <laughs> yeah, I, I can upgrade it and go, okay, you guys want the new in 10 bucks, yeah. 10 bucks. And the bottom line is, I could probably help more people because most people can come up with 10 bucks if they're serious about losing weight. My own family members, I sent them the link. They, they did tell me they downloaded it, never read it. Why? Probably because they didn't, I mean, my family doesn't have a lot of money, but I was like, okay, if they would have spent 10 bucks, I wonder if that would have flipped that little switch in their brain. That's what everyone tells me. It's like just charging a dollar might cause people to go, well, I paid something for it, I better read it. So I've thought about doing that over the years, um, but yeah. Well, it's like the book thing. Like you, you, you've been there. Like when you, when you self published, I, I, I technically it's self publishing on Amazon, right? Which is awesome. But Hillary handheld the whole process because she is a publisher too. So I was like, thank you. So I honored her on the book. So it does mention her publishing company because she helped handhold all of this. So she gets all the cred. And, but at the end, it's Amazon's KDP system is pretty badass. Like you were, again, I learned that from you. I was like, okay. Okay, and video use that. I don't have to worry about committing to so many books to a publishing company and have them tell me what to do. And then good luck trying to align that with a charity. You think a publishing company is going to let me do that? Oh, God, no. No, yeah. no, no. You would have to start up an, a loan art corporation and everything else. It, oh, it's it's yeah. crazy what you would have to do. But with us, uh, yeah, there's a publishing company for ours too. It's called Pistachio Press. Yeah. I'm Pistachio Press. <laughs> I thought with... about doing it. I thought about doing it. Yeah, and then, yeah. I, then again, I was like, because Hillary was such a great teammate. I was like, Hillary, I'd rather... I believe in helping others along the way along if they're going to, if she's going to help make this book kick ass, then let me help her, you know, blow up her new publishing company. And she did confirm. And I checked with a couple of experts that if you add our tie to a publishing label, which you did too, technically you made your own, that it adds some more substantial credibility, blah, 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 whatever. So I was like, okay, fine. Again, all I want this to do is create a way to give back. And if nothing else, money aside, if people read it, and eventually listen to it once the audiobook is done, even better, right? So inspiration, motivation, get you know, get your ass in gear, you know, take risks in life, you know, load your load your life into a Toyota Foreigner like you did, load your life into an old Subaru Outback and and take a big step and see where it takes you. So you never know until you try well, it. <laughs> it's called so you want to be a hot shot, you can get it on Amazon, folks. Uh, before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytarters.com, click through the banner, and uh, it will um, put a little coal in the fire and get our train down the track. If you click right on the book club and that book, so you want to be a hot shot, which will be a link with this podcast, then that brings you right to Amazon and it, it helps us out too. So go check that out. We also have a super fan page <clears throat> at vinnytarteries.com. So check that out. Also, I'm going to stop.